Now we're going to look at various development strategies for getting your product developed. And there are various options for individuals and small teams to develop a new hardware product. If you don't have the technical knowledge to properly manage product development and to judge the quality of the work being done, then having a technical advisor is a must regardless of which of these development strategies you follow. The first strategy I want to talk about is developing the product yourself, and this will apply, I know, to many of you. But this is rarely a viable strategy completely on its own. Very few people have all the skills needed to develop a market-ready electronic product completely on their own. Even if you happen to be an experienced engineer, are you an expert in electronics design, programming, 3D modeling, injection molding, and manufacturing? Probably not. That being said, if you have the necessary skills, the further you can take development of your product yourself, the more money you will save. But don't take it too far. If, if your sub-expert skills cause you to develop a less than optimal product, then that's obviously a big mistake. Also, any new skills you must learn will take time, and that may ultimately lengthen the time to market. Always bring in experts to fill in any gaps in your own expertise, but be sure to remain involved in all the key development decisions. What works best for a lot of people is to do the parts of the design yourself that you're most comfortable with and then outsource the rest. If you're an electrical engineer, then you can do the electronics design and outsource the enclosure design. Or vice versa, if you're a mechanical engineer, then you can design your enclosure and then outsource the design of the electronics. The second strategy is to bring on a technical co-founder. If you're a non-technical founder, then it's definitely wise to bring on a co-founder with technical skills that you may be lacking. At least one of the founders on your startup team needs to be, at the very least, they need to understand enough about product development to manage the entire process. If you plan to eventually seek outside funding from professional investors, then you definitely need a team of founders. Professional startup investors know that a team of founders is much more likely to succeed than a solo founder. The ideal co-founder team for most hardware startups has a hardware engineer, a programmer, and then a marketer or someone that's good at sales. Bringing on co-founders may sound like the perfect solution to your problems, but there are, of course, some serious downsides as well. First of all, finding co-founders is really difficult and likely will take a lot of your time. That's valuable time that isn't being spent developing your product. So just be sure to keep that in mind. And finding co-founders is not something you should rush into, and you need to take time to find the right match. Not only do co-founders need to complement your skills, but you also need to like them personally. You are essentially going to be married to them for at least a few years, so be sure you get along well. The major downside of bringing on co-founders is they reduce your equity in the company, since each founder of a company should in most cases have equal equity in the company. So if you're going solo right now, be prepared to give any co-founder half of your company. One of the best ways to fill in gaps in your team's technical ability is by outsourcing to freelance engineers. Just keep in mind that most products will require multiple engineers with different specialties, so you need to manage these engineers yourself if hiring freelancers. Ultimately, someone on the founding team will need to serve as the project manager. Make sure you find an electrical engineer that has experience designing the types of electronics required by your product. Electrical engineering is a huge field of study and a lot of engineers lack any experience with circuit design. For the 3D designer of your enclosure, make sure you find someone that has experience with injection molding technology. Otherwise, you'll likely end up with a product enclosure that can be prototyped, but that can never be mass manufactured without a significant redesign. Another development option is to outsource everything to a design firm. The best known product design firms can generate fantastic product designs, but they're also insanely expensive. Startups in general should avoid large, well-known design firms at all costs. These top design firms can charge over $500,000 to fully develop your new product. 
Even if you can afford to hire an expensive product design firm, don't do it. There are also many smaller, lesser known design firms that I commonly work with that can develop your product at a much more reasonable price. The cost for these smaller firms usually falls closer to the cost of hiring freelancers, yet with more oversight and better quality procedures in place. One final comment on working with product design firms is you have to discard the false belief that you can have someone else handle all of your product's development while you just wait on the sidelines. People who go down that path almost always get burned and lose a lot of money and time. You really need to be involved in the development and you need to understand at least the basics of the development process as well as the various design trade-offs being made. The development strategy that I used with my own product was I did most of the initial design myself, but then I eventually partnered, partnered with a manufacturer to finish the development. One avenue to consider is partnering with an overseas manufacturer that already makes products that are similar to your own. Large manufacturers have their own engineering and development departments to work on their own products. If you can find a manufacturer already making something similar to your product, they may be able to do everything for you, including development, engineering, prototyping, mold production, and manufacturing. This strategy of working with a manufacturer to do the development can lower your upfront development costs significantly. Manufacturers will, however, amortize these costs, these engineering costs, which means that they'll want to add an additional cost per unit of your product once for the first few production runs. This essentially works like an interest-free loan, allowing you to slowly pay back your development costs to the manufacturer. Sounds great and easy, so what's the catch? There's, there's always a catch, right? The, the main risk to consider with this strategy is you are putting everything related to your product into a single company. They are going to want an exclusive manufacturing agreement, at least until their costs have been recovered. This means you can't migrate to a cheaper manufacturing option when your production volume increases. Also be warned that many manufacturers may want part or all of the intellectual rights to your product. The overall downside of this strategy of partnering with the manufacturer to do the development is ultimately you're going to have a lot less control over your project. Finally, keep in mind that in many cases you're probably going to want to use a combination of these different development strategies. For example, you may design part of the product yourself with the help of a co-founder then outsource the other parts that you're not comfortable doing to a freelance engineer or a design firm. Or perhaps you'll do the entire first pass of the design yourself or with a co-founder, then hire freelance engineers or design firm to finalize the design for manufacturability.